Well, again, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Museum of Flight. My name is Ron Hobbs and I'm the uh, Public Programs Coordinator for the day. And uh, I'm just delighted that you could come in on this rainy uh, Seattle afternoon and uh, join us for what I think is going to be a great program, of course. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Peter Steckel. Uh, Peter was born in New York City and was raised in Los Angeles. It seems that he's been a lifelong lover and explorer of the wilderness. Uh, he described uh, to me over lunch that the uh, Southern Sierra uh, was his, he considered it his backyard as he was growing up. He currently resides in Seattle uh, with his wife, and he just wrote a book, and I'll let you, him tell you about it. Uh, please welcome Peter Steckel. Thank you, Ron. I want to begin by thanking the Museum of Flight for uh, inviting me to make a presentation today. I truly appreciate all of you coming out on this fine, fine day when you could be having fun at the beach or gardening or something like that. And uh, I, um, make sure I know how to do this. There we go. In uh, August of 2007, I was hiking in Northern Kings Canyon National Park with my long-term hiking friend, Michelle. And we were on the Mendel Glacier in Kings Canyon National Park, and we were looking for wreckage from an airplane similar to this one. There we go, the uh, Beach 18 AT-7 Navigator. And the reason we were up there is because in um, November of 1942, a military training exercise, pilot and three student navigators disappeared. They took off from Mather Field near Sacramento, California, and were never heard from again. The pilot was William Gamber. On board was aviation cadet John Mortensen, aviation cadet Ernest Glenn Munn, and aviation cadet Leo Mustinen. They were training to be navigators on the big bombers of World War II, the B-17. They left from, from Matherfield, California on November 18, 1942 in AT7 number 41-21079. Here we have the crew list. And this is from the, the uh, Army Air Force's accident report. Five years later, wreckage from the airplane was found here on the Mendel Glacier in Kings Canyon National Park. It was found by four college students from UC Berkeley they were all veterans. They had come back from uh, combat duty in Europe and in the South Pacific. And before going back to school at UC Berkeley, they decided they'd spend the entire summer on a backpacking and pack stock trip throughout the Sierra to go fishing. And uh, on a lark, they headed up into Darwin Canyon. They didn't find any fish. And they knew there were some glaciers up in the canyon. They thought they'd go up to the glaciers and uh, fool around and uh, they discovered airplane wreckage. They recorded their, um, they, they all went back to school a couple months later. They were at a fraternity party and they had pretty much forgotten um, finding the airplane wreckage. And it was one of those cases where everybody was sitting around drinking beer and talking about how they'd spent their summer vacation. And they said, oh yeah, we were at this, uh, at the site in uh, Darwin Canyon and we found airplane wreckage. And one of the uh, fraternity brothers was still on reserve duty with uh, Hamilton Airfield in Marin County. He reported to his superiors. They contacted the students. And one of the students, uh, George Bond, guided two army captains up to the, 
the crash site in late September, early October of 1947. And they found a couple of the engines. They found both of the engines. And on one of the engines was an identification plate similar to this one, which I, this particular airplane is identified as 4215511. But the, the one on the engine they found had 4121079, which identified it as the aircraft that had disappeared in November of 1942. In uh, conducting my research, I was able to find the accident reports from 1942 and the follow-up in 1947. It uh, describes the, uh, uh, the date uh, located on Darwin Glacier, wreckage on a 60-degree slope, identified by the engine tag, and noted that no bodies were recovered. So the following year, 1948, the Army sent this fellow up, Captain uh, Roy F. Salzbacher. Salzbacher spent World War II in the uh, mortuary services. He was trained as a mortician. He went to school as a mortician. He spent the war in the South Pacific uh, establishing uh, KIA cemeteries and uh, identifying remains, and in some cases towards the end of the war, in repatriating the remains back to uh, the United States. On his second trip up to the crash site in 1948, uh, Captain Sulzbacher was accompanied by several mountain troops, they called them, from Fort Lewis. Did anyone from Fort Lewis make it here this afternoon? Excellent. Um, I like showing this picture to mountaineers because um, these are crampons. They're, they're uh, devices that mountaineers put on the bottoms of their boots with big, sharp teeth in them so they can walk across ice. Today, crampons are made out of aluminum. They're very lightweight. Uh, these are probably uh, stainless steel and probably weighed a pound or two each. Uh, instead of modern climbing ropes that we get accustomed to these days, uh, they were carrying these uh, these hanks of probably manila sisal rope. Uh, their, their boots had um, tunnels uh, that would come up to like their knees and they could fold it over. And then these fine garden trowels for uh, digging through the ice. Definitely low tech when we compare it today, but pretty high tech stuff in the 1940s. Unfortunately, on both of Salzbacher's two 1948 trips, he was not successful in recovering any remains. He refound the wreckage that the students had found in 1947 and had shown to the two captains in 1947. I think one of the reasons he was unsuccessful, um, particularly on his second trip, is because Salzbacher was suffering from polio, poliomyelitis of the bulbar type as it says on his death certificate. The bulbar type is the kind that would attack a person's lungs. And I think most people in the auditorium today are either old enough to have um, been alive during the time when polio was such a scourge, or at least be old enough to have known someone who uh, spent their, their life in an iron lung because the polio had affected their lungs and they were unable to breathe. Well, Sulzbacher didn't know he had polio, and it must not have been a very good thing for him to be at an elevation of over 12 and 13,000 feet with a disease that was attacking his lungs. And a couple days after he returned from uh, Kings Canyon, he died. He had just enough time to develop some photographs and possibly make an oral report to his superiors before he, par he uh, passed away. And nothing was uh, remembered or done about the missing aircraft until October of 2005, when a couple of climbers were here in the Mendel Glacier to climb up an ice field that disappears off to the side of the photograph. And these two, two fellows were uh, 
in, um, what's the nice way to say? They were in not very good weather conditions. The wind was howling, it was below freezing, it was uh, snowing, or starting to snow. It was a very, very bad day to be outside. And so they were walking up the glacier with their hoods on. So pretty much tunnel vision. But nonetheless, one of them was able much, pretty much through serendipity, at the corner of his eye, he saw a piece of material flapping in the wind, kind of like prayer flags, he described to me. And when he walked up to that material, this is what he saw. What we're looking at is the remains of one of the four boys on the missing airplane. And this is uh, his backside, about here, his... Uh, right shoulder, about here, and the 1984 refers to uh, a identification number on his seat type parachute. So they reported their find to the uh, National Park Service because that's where they were and the Park Service contacted JPAC, the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command, who's uh, job it is to find and repatriate the remains of, of lost service personnel. And um, they recovered the remains, and about five months later, the remains were identified as belonging to Kitet Leo Mustanen. And they did a combination of CSI-type stuff that we see on TV. Uh, they did a genetic testing, DNA testing, but because Mustanen didn't have any living relatives on the female side of his family, they are unable to get a positive identification. Through process of elimination, uh, they, they knew it wasn't the other three. And they also were able to find, they found a, a name tag on Mustanen's lapel, similar to this one, and looking at it under different colored lights, they were able to lift off four of the letters. So process of elimination and the old-fashioned type of detection work, they decided that the remains belonged to Leo Mustanen. But how could the remains have belonged to a crew member when the information we had said that the airplane had crashed on Darwin Glacier, not Mendel Glacier, where Mustanen was found? And Darwin Glacier is about a quarter of a mile away. And so here we are back at the um, information provided in the 1942 report um, saying that the wreckage had been found on Darwin Glacier. <clears throat> also that the route was to Corning, California. Corning is north of Sacramento. Here's Corning, here's Mather Field in Sacramento, here's Mendel Glacier. How could that be? Also, the accident report said that no bodies were, were recovered. If that was so, then who was the frozen airman, which is what uh, we called Mustanen before he was finally identified? Who was the frozen airman? if no bodies had been recovered. There it is, no bodies are recovered. And I also want to note that in the official report, they have the date wrong. They said the 8th of November, 1942, instead of the 18th. And finally, how could three navigators be lost? I mean, even three student navigators, you would figure that they would know the difference between north and south, right? Even if you're a student navigator. Okay. How did I get involved with a frozen airman and Leo Mustanen's story? It all begins when I was 12 years old. I was a Boy Scout. I went to a summer camp in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. And for a kid who was born uh, and raised in big urban areas, getting up to the mountains for the first time was an amazing experience. I had never seen trees this big in LA. 
huge waterfalls, amazing scenery. The Sierra Nevada became my first love. And as I got older and I did more and more hiking and climbing in the Sierra Nevada, particularly in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park, it did grow to become my, my backyard. And based on my experience, I couldn't understand all the things that didn't make sense in the story. How could they, how could the army have said that they were flying north to Corning when they were found 150 miles southeast of Mather? How could they say no bodies were recovered when there's a headstone at Golden Gate National Cemetery south of San Francisco? It has the names of the crew, Gamber, Munn, Mortensen, Mustadin, November 18, 1942. How could there be a headstone there if no bodies were recovered? How could the frozen airmen have been found on Mendel Glacier when the official report said Darwin Glacier, a quarter of a mile away? And the newspaper and television reports at the time in 2005 did nothing to answer any of these questions. In fact, the newscasters pretty much muddied the water by confusing everything even, even more. And so I was able to secure a magazine assignment to uh, write on the story to try to figure out uh, what all the erroneous information was, straighten it out. Uh, the more and more I researched the story, the deeper and deeper I became involved in it and realized that there was more to it than just a magazine story. And so that's why I was here at the Mendel Glacier in August of 2007. I wanted to solve, which 